whatever beauty there may be that my eyes do see may your beauty ever be inside this heart whatever work my hands can share So many stars do shine on me, so many prayers of peace there be. May that peace be found in me within this heart. And may that peace fill up the world from ocean steps to stars. Dance will be your rhythms play so endlessly and move my feet continually in your dance. I give to you my every song, my mind and heart to you belong. And when at last life's dance is done, to you I. Whatever beauty there may be that my eyes do see, may thy beauty ever be inside this heart. Whatever work my hands can share with best effort and Good morning, everyone. Durga, if I ever tell you I want the podium higher, ignore me completely. <laughs> I, 
feel like a little kid at the grocery store. <laughs> All right, well today's subject's an odd one. What am I doing? That's a, an odd question, but <laughs> honestly, it's been very central to my spiritual life and definitely to my monastic life. There's been plenty of times in the last, what, it's 20, coming up on 23 years <laughs> of, of uh, attempting monasticism. And, uh, you know, yesterday I, we were talking, uh, is Krishna Prana here? I can't remember the name of the dog that sits, that used to sit cross-legged on their couch. <laughs> Priscilla, there it is, a name that should be remembered. A, cow, a dog that lived in the, in the convent, with, used to sit on the couch. Well, of course, the couch is frayed a little bit. And I, I, I identified with Priscilla there for a while. I thought somehow I've been allowed to chew up couches in plenty of monasteries for the last 22 years. And I'm always wondering how it is uh, that the master still opens the door <laughs> to let me in, that I haven't found myself out in a yard somewhere uh, trying to make a go of things where I can't hurt anybody. But with that idea in mind, this question of what are we doing? <laughs> what are we up to? You know, I, the first time, well, it's not the first time, actually. The first time I asked that question was my first night in the monastery. Uh, I remember showing up with my bag at the door at 8 o'clock, just as I was told, and Swami Prabhupada answering the door uh, and uh, saying, oh, you're prompt, that is good, and then calling Tyagisha Chaitanya, the other brahmachari there, the other novice, to come and show me to my room. And I remember being taken up to this room that was already furnished, already had bedspreads on the bed, there was already a pillow there, there was already books in the bookshelf, the pictures were already hung. And I sat down there on the bed and put my bag in the closet and uh, went to sleep, went to bed. And I remember crying as I was going to bed, thinking, wow, this is what I've done. I live in a room, I live in a room now with nothing of my own. <laughs> Somebody else has chosen my pictures and chosen my books, made my bed, uh, presumably slept in the bed before myself. And uh, it, was a, it was one of those moments where I was like, wow, are you sure about this? <laughs> you know, look what you're doing. And again, it happened at six years. After six years being in, that question again arose in my mind. It was like, wow, six years. You know, if, I, if I'm going to do something else with my life, age-wise, it's about time to start thinking about that. <laughs> Make sure this is where we're going to take it home. And then again, just last year, you know, hitting my mid-50s, the, the second half of my 50s, actually. And, uh, you know, seeing the last... It, it's scary when the time in the monastery, which seems so short to me, and the time to 80, are coming close to the same. It's like, wow, I know how long that time is, and that time is not so very long. And when we start coming into these periods of life, or these periods of thinking, I guess, or of awareness, or of a sobriety, where you start looking around and you think, really, <laughs> is this it? Is, is this what I'm doing? Is this where we're going? It, there's a great deal of encouragement to be taken from those who have walked before us, from those who have had success in the past, and seen the things that we know are real, but want to touch for ourselves. And I want to read a, a, just a short poem from Hafiz, called Everywhere, which sums up my, my dreams about monasticism. <laughs> Running through the streets and screaming, throwing rocks through windows and using my own head to ring great giant bells, pulling out my hair and tearing off my clothes, tying everything I own to a stick and setting it on fire. What else can Hafiz do tonight to celebrate to celebrate this madness, this joy of seeing the divine everywhere. <laughs> that is what we're doing. We're trying to go insane with love, to be overwhelmed with the beauty and amazement of being alive, to take our cubicle mazes and to turn them into sources of inspiration, taking our homes, some of them broken, and restoring them to strength and to inspiration and to a safe space where we know that we're loved, where we know that we're cared for, where we know that we're going to be all right. 
And this is the quest of spiritual life, to know that you have all that you're looking for already, that you are the very source of that which you are seeking, that you are the strength that you're hoping for, that you are the purity you're trying to master, you are the clear and pure mind that you're trying to touch and to see God in. In a book called I Am That, Sri Nishargadatta, my favorite cigarette maker, Sage, in Bombay, is sitting and talking to his disciples, and one of his disciples turns to him and says, well, people are all talking about seeing God. And Maharaj looks at him quite interestedly and says to him, when you see the world, you're seeing God. There is no seeing God apart from the world. Beyond the world, to see God is to be God. The light by which you see the world, which is God, is the tiny little spark I am, apparently so small, and yet the first and the last in every act of knowing and loving. This whole notion that, that our exercise is to stop seeking God, Stop trying to go out and look for an object that's so amazing and so great and so big and so powerful and so beautiful that we want to fall down in front of it and call it God. He's saying everything that you've seen is divine. Everything you've touched and heard, every inspiration you felt, that time you've stood in front of art and said, wow, that's beautiful, that time you stood down on our you know, Summerland beach here and watch the sunset and thought, my God, that's amazing. When you're flipping through a magazine and seeing the pictures that the Hubble have, has taken of these nebulas and things that I don't even know what the words mean but are just awe-inspiring, both in beauty and in size, and you sit there and you realize these things have been there unappreciated, unseen, presumably, for billions of years. That's how we know the nature of the world. That's where we learned karma yoga. That's where we learned to do things without expecting a result, but to do them as worship, to do them in response to this amazing world that we live in, this beauty that was just created by the divine for the sake of that, of being. All the beauties that I saw the first time driving into the Yosemite Valley and knowing that there was a time when the first man or woman walked into that valley and saw that place that had been there for thousands of years, maybe millions of years, beautiful, serene, and quiet, ever-present. And it brought to mind that uh, it, at, the, at the monastery in San Francisco, I was responsible for keeping the garden weeded, and it wasn't doing so well. <laughs> I can't imagine why that happened. But it wasn't doing so well, and Swami was standing in the dining room window one day before lunch, uh, looking out the window over the garden I was responsible for. And he says, uh, he says, have you seen the garden lately? I says, yes, Maharaj. He says, you know, Thakur, Sri Ramakrishna, takes a walk in the garden every day. Have you prepared it for him? Have you prepared the garden for him? And I walked away having a very different perspective on having not done the garden, you know, that it turned from being this duty to feeling like I somehow had not brought my lover flowers, you know, to feeling somehow that I hadn't cherished something deeply important to me. When you see the world, when you see anything and everything, you are seeing your beloved, your divine, every set of eyes in this room this morning. It's part of an exercise that I play with to look at them and to pray to the one sitting behind them, to pray to that one before he has become you, before he has gone through the mill of the mind to come out as your friendly and happy personality, before he went through the body to come out as a gender, as an age, as a sex, to look in your eyes and see you before your troubles, before your perceived hungers and lacks, to find that you and to say good morning to that you the way we did quite early today. Maharaj goes on to say, when you know the name of a thing or of a person, you can find it easily. By calling God by his name, 
you make him come to you. You know, it's one of the things Sri Ramakrishna says. He says, God's willing to give you everything. The one thing he doesn't really give out freely enough, and we can all attest to this, is pure love for love's own sake. He says, because if he gives you that, he becomes enslaved to you. He cannot say no to pure love. She cannot say no to pure love. She cannot say no to the devotee. And so that's why God is, makes, makes radically sure that you have laid everything else down before that final gift of pure love for its own sake overwhelms you and takes you to the vision that you've always dreamed of, that pure love. So know his name. What is his name? Rabia has a wonderful poem. I got a creek just in the wrong place here. That Rabia has this wonderful poem where she says, I've been calling on God for years and I've gotten no response. And it occurred to me, well, perhaps I was using the wrong name. Maybe I'm calling the wrong, the wrong person, the wrong God, and no one's showing up. And so she said she went deep into prayer, and she thought of a nickname for her own beloved that was special to just her. And she said, I called out in my prayer with my nickname for the beloved. And her last line of that poem is, and that has made all the difference. You know, here a thousand years later, we're still reading those poems. So this notion of loving God and having a very personal relationship, not with just perhaps an imagined being outside of yourself, perhaps not an imagined personality, but perhaps a relationship of love with everything that you're doing. Maybe a loving relationship with everything that you're seeing, that you're undertaking, that maybe your worship isn't so much about offering an occasional flower or sending up an occasional prayer, but maybe it's in the way that you speak to the woman at the grocery store. Maybe it's in the way that you pray to the produce man as he's laying out the vegetables in front of you. Maybe it's the way that you treat the person that just cut you off on the freeway. Maybe this idea of loving God is much bigger than a shrine much bigger than a temple, much bigger, much more important than an institution. Maybe it's something that involves just you and a heart and the beloved. The questioner says, well, when he comes to me, what shape will he take? Maharaj says, oh, one according to your expectations. If you happen to be unlucky and some saintly soul gives you a mantra for good luck and you repeat it with faith and devotion, your bad luck, it's bound to turn around. Steady faith is stronger than destiny. Destiny is the result of causes, mostly accidental, and is therefore loosely woven. Confidence and good hope will overcome it easily. This immediately reminds me of uh, Vivekananda's words. He says, in the olden times, an atheist was he who didn't believe in God. He says, but I tell you now, an atheist is he who does not believe in himself, who does not know the presence of that divinity within him or her, to not know that soul of strength, that soul of love, that soul of mercy, that soul of forgiveness, is all within yourself. That the beloved has written a note to you to reflect all of those highest ideals of this world, the mind, the soul, the saint. And he's tucked it inside of you as an image, a reflection. He's made you what you are. He's given you the intelligence to understand and to ask and to experiment and explore this world He's given you the love and the ability to recognize and to share that love. He's given you a sense of beauty so that you can live in a place like this and be inspired every time you walk out of a door. He is that love, that card, that invitation that is within you, that is always somehow asking to be recognized, asking to be found. He comes according to your expectations and your steady faith is stronger than your destiny, and your confidence and good hope 
will overcome everything easily. You see, because the battle, if it's a battle, lies within you. You've chosen a battle. You see, you are, you are that one without a second. And all of your troubles are of your own creation. It's your own attachment that you've put on things that are temporary. And when they go away, you suffer. And you think, why me? It's putting undue responsibility on loved ones to be your Prince Charming, to be your Snow White, to be your strength, to be your better half, to fulfill your life, to make you whole. When no one but God could ever take on such a responsibility, such a strength of faith and expectation, only that which cannot change, which cannot die, which cannot go away, would ever dare to take on such a responsibility. That's what we're up to. That's what we're trying to touch within ourself. That's what we're trying to find, to have that which will manifest through us and be that divine whole that, Vivica, that Ramakrishna used to describe himself, to be that divine whole through which God can be seen so that it's easy when someone looks into your eyes to see the divine love that's there behind you when you are looking at them and seeing that divine love so easily in their eyes, and for the first time they feel somebody look at them, not at their eyes, not at their body, not at their face, not at their personality, but that wonderful fulfillment and security that comes that first time you meet a holy person who knows how to see you. And not all of your mistakes, not all of your selfishness, not all of your grandiose, you know, enjoyments of your own personality, but looks at you, that self behind it all. The questioner goes on, is a little bit more interested in seeing this divinity in all things. And he asks, you know, I was told to chant a mantra. When I do that, when I chant a mantra, what exactly is happening? What's going on? And, Ma and Maharaj answers, the sound of the mantra creates a shape which will embody the self. The self can embody any shape and operate through it. After all, the self is expressing itself in action, and a mantra is primarily energy in action. It acts on you. It acts on your surroundings. So this mantra, this, this, if, you're, if you're doing a mantra meditation or a mantra practice, repeating a name of God over and over and over again, and actually in an odd way, we're all doing that anyway, which we'll get to in a second, but this notion of repeating a mantra when you say God, of course, every one of us is going to understand that differently. You know, we, we, and it's always been my experience, no matter what church I was sitting in or what temple I was visiting, if you ask people what God is, you're going to get a multitude of answers, even though they're all claiming to be in the same you know, institution or the same religion. There's always such a vast uh, experience of what the divine is, and every one of them is valid. And when you say the name God in your mind, or say the word love, or say the word beauty, or say the word truth, or any of the other synonyms for our beloved, what comes? The mind creates an attempt to see to understand. And each time it makes an attempt, the walls get pushed just a little bit farther out. Another puff of air goes into that balloon and it expands. It gets a little bit larger each time. And as you sit there in the shrine of the heart, yelling out your beloved's name in a great hope and maybe a little bit of madness, and that expansion continues to happen, you, you start to find there's no room for you in that little shrine. You start having to back up again, get against that wall. And pretty soon you become as thin as the paint of that wall. You're sitting in there hearing this wonderful reverberation of the name of the beloved and the idea of love, the notion of contentment, that peace that transcends understanding begins to take root and begins to expand. And you find that both the image on the shrine and you as the worshiper are getting smaller and smaller as love increases between you, as understanding begins to merge between you, as intelligence begins to blur its boundaries and start to merge between you. And you come to understand in the end that it wasn't you that was God, and it wasn't the image or the idea of God that was God, but that it was the love that those two things inspired when they touched each other 
and disappeared. That was love. That is love. And that is what your mantra does each time it's repeated within you. That name of God expands your understanding, expands your longing, and reminds you of a nature that's just beyond touch. The questioner says, well, the mantra is traditional. It's, it's cultural, isn't it? Does it have to be so? Maharaj says, well, since time immemorial, a link was created between certain words and corresponding energies and reinforced by numberless repetitions. It is just like a road to walk on. It's an easy way. Only faith is needed. You trust the road to take you to your destination. And so he plants this firmly within a culture that has been doing mantra practices since almost since time immemorial, where these same mantras have been handed down from guru to guru to guru to guru. And you know, here we hear that, oh, it's been handed down from guru to guru to guru. And for us in the West, you know, history and ancestry are like Kleenex, <laughs> you know, very, very few of us can, can go back more than one or two generations in our own families to know who's there. I was really embarrassed when I went to do my sannyas ceremony in India back in 2012. And one of the things I had to do was, was do my own little uh, funeral ritual for myself. And then also for all my family and friends, because as a monk, I wasn't going to be able to do those things. And I sat there and I was, you know, you had to put on a sheet of paper your family lineage. You know, I, I was like, oh, well, okay, let's see. I think my grandmother's first name was Helen. Her mother, oof, I think she was German. <laughs> I knew nothing. And I was watching these young men on either side of me sitting there scribbling and going back generation after generation after generation after generation of all the people that they had been a part of. I met a Swami once who was a traditional uh, uh, Brahmin, and his family in their home, the hearth fire, the fire on their shrine, had been burning continuously in the same spot for 1,200 years. This is what we owe to a culture so faithful to bring this gift to us today in this time to a people who after generations and generations and generations have sat down as two and three and four and five year olds and memorized Sanskrit scripture so that that portion of the scripture given to their family to preserve, to make sure that it lasts another generation, that that three year old sat there day in and day out with his teacher reciting those verses so that he could do it to his children, so that they could do it to their children all the way this faithful gift has been carried and been brought to you this morning. These mantras, ages old, that have brought, made saint after saint after saint, that have ushered in the ways of Jesus and Buddha, and Rama and Krishna and Ramakrishna. This wonderful and marvelous history that goes back before a nation, that's how we get to share in it. We can't stop and say, oh, thank you, India, for being a country that produced and brought and maintained these things, these treasures to us. No, we say thank you, brother, because it comes from a time before in India, before a United States, before a Russia, before a Ukraine, when we were just people wandering a world, seven rishis asking the question, what is going on? What am I doing? And retiring to the mountains to find out. Since time immemorial, this link has been created between certain words and corresponding energies. Trust in the road to take you to your destination. Well, the questioner gets a little jumpy here. He says, well, in Europe, there's no tradition of a mantra, except in some contemplative orders. Of what use is it to a modern young Westerner? Well, here's a controversial answer for you. <laughs> Maharaj answers, none unless he is very much attracted, you know, unless, it, unless it does produce that eagerness inside or that energy for it. He says, for him, the right procedure is to adhere to the thought that he is the ground of all knowledge, that he's the ground of all knowledge. What is the nature of the ground? It doesn't really do anything, right? It's a receiver. It nurtures what's within. 
It feeds the seeds and they grow and they sprout. You are the ground of all knowledge. All knowledge is sprouting from you. The immutable and perennial awareness of all that happens to the senses and the mind. If he keeps it in mind all the time, aware and alert, he is bound to break the bounds of the bonds of non-awareness and to merge into pure life, pure light, pure love. The idea I am the witness only will purify the body and the mind and open the eye of wisdom. Then man goes beyond illusion. His heart is free of all desire. How is it that just being the witness and just knowing the nature of yourself as being the witness is going to purify your body and mind? How is that possible? Because it's going to make you understand that you are separate from your body and your mind, that you are not the body and you are not the mind. This is a regular teaching that comes up all the time because it's a truth we hear all the time. And yet, here we are, trying again, trying to understand something, trying to figure out what's happening. And most of the time, it's because we're using the wrong tools. Because any time we want to know something, we go and we look for objects that can teach us that. Books, gurus, friends, experts, whatnot. And we go about building this castle of thinking and when it gets to a certain height, we're like, ah, okay, I understand that. I've got that. But with spiritual knowledge, they say that this realization, this knowing, that it's the only effect that has no cause, which means it's not your practice that takes you there. It's not something that you're building, that you're going to get in response of something you gave. Vivekananda is very clear in saying that this is not a marketplace where if you give a certain number of mantras or you spend a certain amount of time in, in practice or read a certain number of scriptures or memorize a certain number of spiritual facts that you're going to get there. There's no promise at all. He says it's like a child. God's like a child who's running around with his favorite ball and you, his, his father, can ask for that ball a thousand times and the <laughs> child's not going to give it to you. No, nope, my ball. And then we go rocking down the street and some random stranger, he'll run up and give the ball to them. Oh, I'll take the ball. And you're like, what am I? Burnt toast? <laughs> Why can't I have that? You see, this is the nature of it. It's play. It's the enjoyment of God. The one promise you have, though, from Sri Ramakrishna anyway, is that everybody's going to get fed. Everybody's coming home. It's really just a matter of time. Earnestness and sincerity will quicken the process. You know, doing practice will make the journey <laughs> much less arduous, will, will lessen the suffering that you experience here in the world because you'll understand the nature of the world. You'll understand your own relationship when you understand who you are with the world. So this idea of being the witness only will show you that you're purely watching your mind just like everyone in here is watching their mind. Well, guess what? It's the same eye that's watching every mind in here. It's the same eye watching every body in here. And when we're asked ourselves, I'll bring it up again, this repetition, I sometimes get insecure about it. <laughs> I'm constantly repeating myself. And I'm like, well, I've been repeating everything that I've read and heard for 22 years. I'm still looking. I'm still trying to open my own eyes. How can there be a problem in repetition? We all got up this morning and had breakfast, made our beds. Didn't we do that yesterday and the day before and the day before? So what was the point? You vacuumed this week already. Why are you going to do it again next week? This is that repetition to bring the mind into the arena of the divine over and over again until it knows and understands in silence. Because he says here that we must be aware that we are the ground of all knowledge, the immutable and perennial awareness of all that happens to the senses and the mind. If we keep it in mind all the time, that's why we repeat. We have to keep this knowledge in our mind all the time so that we are constantly seeing the world for the first time again and again, stopping our assumptions about what we are stopping our ignorances, the things that we ignore in life that we don't get and don't understand, so we just kind of don't think about them, leave them outside for a while. 
I am the witness only. The man goes beyond illusion, and his heart is free of all desires. Why? Because you understand the nature of desire, that it's never brought you anything except a hunger for more desires. You know, everything, every, every great birthday you've had just put stress on your next birthday to be at least as good, <laughs> right? Every Christmas gift you got, the ones that you can even remember, just made a hope and a promise that next year you'd get what you wanted, you know, that one thing. And that's the nature of the world. And when we don't get what we want, we're sad. We think, oh gosh, life is horrible. Maybe if you had no desire for that thing, understanding that all it was going to do was give you a little bit of distraction for a short while before it broke, rusted, wore out, was stolen, got lost, or ignored. And then you'd be off and looking again. You know, you get on, we get on these cycles of, of, of ignorance. We stop thinking about the nature of the world. You know, we get married again, eight, nine, ten times, <laughs> thinking, oh, clearly the problem's not with me. <laughs> clearly, it's the person I'm married to. You know, if I get the right one, it's going to be okay. You know, if I get the right children, I'm going to be fine. If I get the right car, then it's going to be cool. But all new cars become uncool within five years, right? So then you have to wait the 20 years for it to pass to become cool again, you know? and then it doesn't run anymore. But this is the thing, this is the nature, this is understanding the nature of ourself and the world, to know that we're, we are the witness, we're looking through a mind and through a body, and the thing about a witness who's observing, it can't be touched, it can't be harmed, it can't be helped, it cannot be given anything. It is the self. It's been watching your body grow and change, watching your mind grow and change, that's what it does. The heart is free of all desires, and just like ice turns to water and water to vapor, and vapor dissolves in the air and disappears in space, so does the body dissolve into pure awareness and then into pure being, which is beyond all existence and non-existence. He goes on to say, purify yourself by a well-ordered and useful life. Be a useful person. <laughs> Be useful to everyone around you. Always, uh, you know, the, 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 the peace pilgrim, that's one of the things she says. She says, every moment to me is an opportunity for service. That was her whole perspective. She says, I stand at the edge of God's dining room like a butler, with my eyes scanning continually for who needs something that I can provide. That that's what it is to manifest God, to need nothing yourself. So you're perfectly happy just to be available for everyone else, making sure all the time, oh, there's an opportunity. Oh, there's a piece of trash. I can pick that up. You know, All these ideas and possibilities around us all the time. So make yourself pure with a well-ordered, a disciplined life. Why a disciplined life? Because a disciplined life is the natural outcome to being a human being who understands that he's not the body. So it doesn't matter that the body doesn't want to get out of bed. <laughs> it doesn't matter that the body wants three more pieces of cake. You know, he himself, she herself, that self, beyond all of those definitions and attributes, is self-contained, doesn't care at all about cake, doesn't care at all about moods, doesn't care at all about needs and hungers. Know that through a well-ordered and useful life. Watch over your thoughts, he says. Watch over your feelings. Watch over your words and your actions. This will clear your vision. How? Because you grow to understand the nature of them. You start seeing patterns in the thing the mind is bothering you about. You begin to see patterns in the needs of the body and the conditions that it's put you in. After the last 20 years of having nine pieces of cake every day, you can't move anymore. <laughs> and you think, wow, how did this happen? It must not have been a well-ordered life. <laughs> so a well-ordered and useful life. Must I renounce everything first, his questioner asks, and then live a homeless life like a monk? <laughs> he doesn't even answer this question. Maharaj says, you can't renounce. <laughs> He says, you might leave your home and give trouble to your family, break their hearts, 
but attachments are in the mind. You're, you're thinking that there's something out there in this world for you to get, for you to take hold of, for you to bring home. That's in your own mind. You can, you can become as homeless as you want. You can wander as much as you like. You can inhabit as many monasteries as you like. If you haven't created a monastery of your own mind, there's no point. Renunciation isn't of the things. It's a knowing of the self. It's a turning within for the things that you're looking for outside. It's finding the confidence within that you're begging for from your relationships outside. It's finding the acceptance within that you're begging for from all the people around you. It's knowing that you are enough and that you're not going to get anything else from outside, not only because it's not there, but because it's not necessary. You are that beautiful divinity. You may leave your home and give trouble to your family, but attachments are in the mind, and they will not leave you until you know your mind, in and out. First thing first, know yourself. All else will come with it. Ask yourself that question. Who's asking? What am I? Well, who's asking what am I? And who am I asking? Take a look at the process of thinking. In thinking, you're two people. The mind is saying something and someone's listening to it. Well, who's saying something? And who's listening to it? Am I two people? Eckhart Tolle, one of the most wonderful things I found out about him, deeply depressed, woke up in the middle of the night thinking about suicide. I can't live with myself anymore, he says. And that's, that thought hit him right square in the forehead. I can't live with myself anymore. He said, who is this self that I can't live with? Am I two people? Are there two of us in here? Know yourself. Look at how your mind works by becoming aware of it all the time. Seeing what it says. Seeing what triggers it seeing what makes it think different things, and come to understand that it has nothing to do with you. It's the wheel of samsara rolling down the hill, and you're just riding along. All you can do is watch it as it goes, occasionally giving little, little nudges here and there, perhaps, seemingly, at the time. Rock, Takur says, Sri Ramakrishna says, that, that free will is it's kind of like a goat that's tethered to a pole. For about eight or ten feet, you've got free will. You can sort of nudge your life this way and that way, but you can't determine where you're born. You can't really determine what your special attributes were for life, the luck that comes your way. You know? And yet the ego has constantly trying to construct a sense of self that's in control, a sense of self that's in charge. Watch out for that. Watch closely at the process that's building that ego and understand that it's ephemeral. Don't rely on it. Don't build an ego thinking that once it's big enough, you'll be able to step on it and keep afloat. Egos always sink, usually very easily. Know yourself. Everything else will come with it. The questioner says, but you already told me that I'm the supreme reality. Isn't that enough self-knowledge? Right? Because that's how we know things. Somebody tells us it. I read it. I read it in a lot of scriptures. I'm the self. I know it. What else do I need to do? I don't have to go to church anymore. <laughs> of course you are the supreme reality, Maharaj says. But what of it? Every grain of sand is God. To know it is important, but that's only the beginning. All right? You can learn about milk, but until you've tasted it, you don't know milk. You know, this is the idea. You can live this life, but until you're communing with God in this life, you don't know living. You don't know love because you're still small. You're still limited and restricted by your mind and ideas of self. What can you do when you're so broken already yourself? How can you help somebody when you know the first criticism is going to break your leg? <laughs> the first wrong rumor is going to set you fleeing in anger, stomping and throwing. Know yourself. Know you are the supreme reality, but know that having this knowledge dropped in your mind is the very beginning of a seed that will sprout and create a unity that engulfs everything. Well, you told me that I'm the supreme reality. I believe you. 
What next is there for me to do? Maharaj, I said, I told you already, discover all that you are not. That's an interesting idea. Discover all that you are not. Your body, your feelings, your thoughts, your ideas, time, space, being, not being, this or that. Nothing concrete or abstract you can point out is you. A mere verbal statement will not do. You may repeat a formula endlessly without any result whatsoever. You must watch yourself continuously, particularly your mind, moment by moment, missing nothing. This witnessing is essential for the separation of the self from the non-self. Remind yourself of what you're not. Now, why doesn't he say remind yourself of what you are? Because immediately, if you try and remind yourself of what you are, you put it in front of you and say, that's what I am. How can you be what's in front of you? You're that which is looking at the thing in front of you. This is not an objective knowledge. This is not something you can put in front of you and say, I'm going to learn this. I'm going to know this. I'm going to achieve this. I'm going to grab this. You can't objectify the self because it is every object, which makes it no object. It is that which, which is asking, that which is watching, that which is knowing, that which is loving. And that is what we are to become aware of all the time because being aware of awareness is the same as bliss, the sages say. Being aware of awareness in this moment will bring you bliss. Even now, as you sit there, instead of listening to me ramble on, think of who's listening. Who, who's, who's got their ear to your ear? Who's, who, who brought you here this morning? Who wanted to know these things? And stretch that idea of self. Become aware of just being here. What does it mean to have no past? What does it mean to have no future? Because that self has only ever been here and now. It hasn't been on a journey. It hasn't been in a life. It is eternally existent everywhere. And you are just an opportunity of it. Know what you are not so that you don't get caught in a bundle of restrictions and limitations called a personality. Discover all you are not, your body, your feelings, your thoughts, your ideas, time, space, being, and not being. Nothing concrete is you. Miss nothing. This witnessing is essential for the separation from the self and the not-self. Saint Isaac of Syria, he will throw in a different sage from another part of the world, around the 1500s, he says, try to en enter your inner treasure house. You will see the treasure house of heaven, for both the one and the other are the same, and one and the same entrance reveals them both. The ladder leading to the kingdom is concealed within you, that is, in your soul. Wash yourself from ignorance and wrongdoing, and you will see the rungs of that ladder by which you can ascend. So here in the 1500s, we have a Christian mystic of the Eastern Orthodox Church sitting in his monastery in Mount Athos and telling you the exact same thing that the sages of India have said, the same things that the sages of Buddhism have said, the same things that the sages of all religions have said. Wash yourself of this wrongdoing. Become aware of your mind. Know who you are. Understand the idea of being an image of God, a reflection of God. Not imagining a will based on a body and mind, but an imagining of freedom, of no will, of no opinion, of no desire for an outcome. Able to accept everything as it is, unaffected, not in a dull sense of like, I don't care, but in the sense that I am a burning fire of love that is not conditioned by the world around me. I will care and I will love regardless of how I'm treated. I will serve and I will worship regardless of what I encounter. I'm not a person of conditions. I'm a person of being, of existence, of love and intelligence absolute. In Luke, the New Testament of the Christians, chapter 10, verse 25, 
He says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, what's written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? The man answered, well, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, you've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this. <laughs> Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, well, then who's my neighbor? And in reply, Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side of the road. <laughs> so too a Levite, when he came to that place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now it's interesting that Jesus, <laughs> his first two examples of what not to be as, as a neighbor, is a priest <laughs> and a Levite, who was, who was the, Ger the, the German, the, the Jewish version of, an Is of a uh, Brahmin. <laughs> You know, that they were the priest, the priestly caste, the religious caste, the, 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 the wisdom caste. So the first two people he's picking on are the, are the two people that you would expect to be a neighbor to everyone. So to a Levite, but then a Samaritan. Now a Samaritan is someone that lived outside of, of, of Israel. They were looked down on. You know, they didn't come and join, if they were Jewish, they didn't come and join the party. They lived outside among the heathens. So they were considered, hmm. You know, you wouldn't greet somebody that was walking away from, from Jerusalem. He only greeted those who were walking toward Jerusalem, you see. So a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, please look after this man and I will return. I'll reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Jesus asked. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the most important commandment. This is the most important thing that can be said this morning. Love your neighbor. That is how we love God. This world we live in is nothing but the manifestation of our beloved. See that. In the words of Vivekananda, stop seeking and begin seeing. Recognize love, beauty, God, divinity in everyone and everything and be the good neighbor to it. Practice it. Every day, repeat to yourself these things. I'm not the mind with its moods and with its hungers. I'm not the body with its shortcomings and its creaks and pains. I am the self, Satchitananda, pure love, pure existence, pure bliss of being. That's what I am. And today I'm the butler, and I'm scanning everything that I see, hear, taste, touch, and smell today for an opportunity to care, for an opportunity to serve because I love God, I love love with all of my mind, with all of my heart, with all of myself, and I'm reserving nothing for the ego. This is how we find the divine. Go and do likewise. Saint Gregory, also another monk from the 1600s, he says a true sanctuary even before the future of life, is a heart free from thoughts. Made active by the Spirit. So a true sanctuary, it's not a temple, not just a sangha. A true sanctuary is your own mind, a mind free of thoughts. Why? Because thoughts are disturbances. Disturbances caused by the ideas of me and mine. Thoughts are imbalance. It's a mind perceived to be unwhole. It's, it's a state of being that, that feels like something is missing. 
Sri Nishrigadatta says that that's the only difference between a saint and a sinner. He said the saint understands the moment is perfect as it is, and the sinner is always trying to improve it. Something is missing. See the divinity around you and find the perfection of the moment, perhaps by a very different measure. For, all, for there all is said and done spiritually, that being activated by the spirit, that's being inspired. Because in that silence of mind, that pure love which is you, that, that in you which recognizes love and knows how to be loving, manifests like the heat of a fire, beautiful. And when the mind is quiet, that is what is activated. That is what inspires you, that bliss of being, that bliss of unity, knowing yourself in everyone. That is what will move you. So in that quietness of the mind, be moved by the spirit, for there is all said and done spiritually. He who has not attained to such a state, although for the sake of some virtues, he may be a stone suitable to be used for building the temple of God, but he is not yet himself a temple or a celebrant of the spirit. This freedom from corruption is understood by some as transition to a better state, but by others as a total abandonment of everything sensory. It is ordained that man must put before all things the universal commandment to remember God, of which it is said, but remember the Lord your God, for it is she who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms her covenant. What destroys us is forgetfulness of God. What shrouds the commandments in darkness and despoils us of all good is the forgetfulness of who we are. Remember who you are through mantras, through songs, through awareness, but in every moment watch your mind, watch your feelings, watch yourself until it becomes clear to you through your own understanding that you are not these changing mortal things, that you are not subject to up and down and back and forth in circles for the rest of your days, that you're free. Take that freedom by knowing you have no desire, no need, and at every moment can go in every direction for no reason at all but the love of God. Take a few moments to think about these things. Oh 
trust your instrument that responds to your mere glance. Whatever I may do, wherever I may be, on the highest mountain or sailing There's a few announcements. Uh, next week, one of your local swamis, Prabhajika Krishnaprana, is going to be giving a lecture on making choices. Uh, Wednesday at 5 p.m., there's a class also by uh, Krishnaprana for Seekers of God. And Saturdays at 5 p.m., there's a class on the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. All of those are taking place here. I don't know if this is to be announced or not, but I'm going to announce it. Saturday at 10 a.m., there's an annual members meeting online only. Members will receive a notice with a link. So it's probably one of those boring things required by, required by bylaws and all of that. Don't worry if you're a member or not. It has nothing to do with anything but legalities <laughs> in that sense. So uh, last week, somebody told me that we could do Q&A after a lecture, and so we'll do that. But if you need to go, go ahead and go. We'll take like a five minute break. And then if you have questions or want to have more conversations on things, I'll come back in here. And if there's enough people, I'll stand behind a microphone. Otherwise, I'll just sit in a chair or on the stairs or something and we can talk about things. All right. Jai Ma. Jai Takura. All right, can you hear me? Is it on still? Yes, I'm still online. Hello, Nikki, online. <laughs> All right, is there a question or a seed for conversation? Yes. Simple question. Uh huh. Yeah, which what the source was. Uh, the source for Sri Nishogadatta Maharaj is a book called I Am That. And uh, I'll tell you ahead of time, the best way to read that book is very slowly. It's, a, it's, a, it's just a book of couplets, questions and answers. And uh, I read that for the first time, gosh, back to the early 2000s when I was in the, con in the convent, in the monastery in San Francisco. And I would sit in this nice big wingback chair in the front room with the big light coming in there and I'd read just a Q&A. And I would just sit there and I'd read it two, three, four, five times and just try and not cognate about it, just literally try and let it just absorb into, into myself. And it was one of the greatest experiences. I learned so much and was so challenged, really, by a lot of my boundaries that became apparent, a lot of my limitations inside. I grew up a fundamentalist, so I had lots of limitations. <laughs> I had lots of lines drawn, and that book really helped to break that down. Ah, okay. He was asked by one of his American disciples, who was rather frustrated and was sitting next to him and saying, you're sitting there realized you know, you, you know everything, you're in joy and bliss. I can see the joy in your eyes and the weeping that you do when you look at everything. And I'm sitting right here and I don't understand anything you're saying. I can't figure it out. Do something for me. Can't you do something for me? And Sri Nishagadatta uh, smiles at him and says, I have. I have appeared in your dream and I'm telling you, you're sleeping. 
I read that and I just went, Phew. wow, wow. I'm so sorry, but can I ask you to repeat the name of the book? Yes, I Am That by, by Sri Nishagadatta. But I Am That, it's, it's a very 70s looking book on the cover. I think so. Yeah, I, I would assume it would be there. He's 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 from the Vedantic tradition. He's not out of the Ramakrishna order, but uh, yeah, I like him because uh, he, he was a cigarette maker <laughs> and a realized soul. And he would sit there in his little store in in Bombay, rolling the little beaties, you know, those cheap little stinky Indian cigarettes that everybody smokes there, and uh, and and teach, you know sometimes thousands of people showing up for for uh, his his company so quite a fascinating figure a great demonstration that you can work in the world even at something like making cigarettes and come to your realization you know God is Dios. Interesting. Yeah, I you know there's I've I've met a number of people that have had different experiences in their life, and uh, I never know what to think about them. You know, you can't. I I certainly don't judge them or try and eliminate them, but I try to learn and listen from them. You know, things like that. But I I, I really think that you have that experience. You you could you can definitely have. Uh, many levels of a spiritual experience that give you a lot of encouragement and uh, you know can put you into a monastery sometimes these these encounters but I think more important is to understand that those are not exceptions that someone who's in the condition of Sri, Sri Nishagadatta Maharaj could come to you and be taught by God you know could have a conversation with any one of us and just because of their own state of mind being in awareness of the presence of God in all things, that it, it, it tunes a certain part of the mind and a certain, certain part of the heart. And God becomes a constant companion where everything that you're doing is like a step in a dance through the day. Everything is a spiritual experience and everyone and everything is a teacher. There's plenty of stories in the scripture about of a cow being a teacher, a fire being a teacher, a wave being a teacher. I remember there was a time, back when I was a, a, a practicing Christian, I remember going to a rocky cliff uh, in a place called Sea Cliff in San Francisco and sitting there and just asking God, you know, in that context, teach me right now, just teach me something. And so I sat there just watching the waves crashing on the rocks and you know idea after idea came to life from that and I had been there many times and not thought anything of God and so I think really this practice well the practice of the presence of God from Brother Lawrence is a great book about someone who did it constantly but we are our own story you know be be to live consciously is really what we're trying to do. That, that encapsulates a lot. That, that means letting go of the idea of our past. It means letting go of our idea of a projected future and really being present in the moment and not using our past conditioning to interpret it for us and not using our desires for the future to cloud it with unnecessary meaning. You know, but in that pregnant silence of knowledge. There was a Swami Dhamodarananda at uh, Belur Mat, an old Swami, 
and uh, so loving. He, the brahmacharis used to follow him around like puppies. I mean, <laughs> he was always so kind, and they, you'd go to his room at night, and there'd be 10 or 15 of us novices just sitting on the floor in front of him, and, uh, you know, he would, he would talk, and he would, was telling about the days that he lived in Ramana Maharshi's ashram, and uh, he had gone there to join, and Ramana Maharshi had said to him, no, you're not my student. Your teacher will come. Stay here until they do. And he was there for two years. And one of the things he said about the experience of, of being with Ramana Maharshi is that he would have all of these questions and concerns. And when he would go into the presence of Ramana Maharshi, he could never remember them. They seemed so unnecessary. And he said, actually, any thought that was formed in my mind seemed like an intruder, seemed like somebody that was blocking my view of a very beautiful and profound moment that I wanted nothing in the way for. And I think that is what life is meant to be, you know, where every minute is so full and you're in such anticipation of, well, that's <laughs> probably not anticipation that immediately brings future in, but you're sitting there just knowing that this moment is profound simply by its nature, simply by the fact that you, 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 it's a puzzle you can't figure out. What does it mean to exist? What does it mean to be aware? What does it mean to love? What does it mean to live? You know, what does it mean to die? All of these things, did, they're unanswerable. But in that lack of knowledge, the heart opens. And when that happens, then there's an understanding that can't be put into a word. It's not a philosophy. It's not a castle of thinking. It's, it's built in silence. It exists in peace and doesn't require anything to, to be seen or even understood to be, to be. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know that I have anything mature to say on it yet, but it is something that I'm actively wondering about these days. This notion of the duality that we experience, it begins inside. We see the world as dual because we ourselves are dual. Uh, the greatest explanation of that, really, I found, is, is the story of Adam and Eve in the Old Testament. Uh, where uh, Eve goes out through the senses when she sees that fruit of the knowledge of good and evil in the, in the tree that she was told not to eat of. And she looks at it, and three things happen. She, one, she saw that it was beautiful, and so it tantalized her. The second is that she thought to herself, oh, would, that would be good food. I should take it. I should store it in my memory. I should partake of it. And then her third thing, it will, it will give me wisdom and I'll be like God. And so this sets up our dilemma. That happens every moment for us. We get into the senses, the body and mind. We get tantalized by the experience of them, by the colors, the tastes, the sounds, the shapes. And then we want, I want to make this a part of me. So we either put it into the mind as a memory, a samskara, something that's going to affect our future. Uh, and we think we're going to get what we need. We're going to become like God, which means to be whole. We're, we're going to get that thing that we're looking for. And as long as we live in that state of being deluded by the senses, and by deluded I mean stepping out of our awareness of the moment and the presence of the divinity in the moment, we step into the senses which give us a need and a distraction and a hunger, and then we get busy about taking care of trouble, you know, and we get caught in that space. And uh, so in doing that, that's what the knowledge of good and evil is. The, 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 the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was actually ego. It was, actually you, it was actually Eve or you or me because it's a cycling story. It happens continually every moment. This is our condition and the world is, Sri Nishikadatta actually makes that statement, the world is created new every moment. And so in this moment, the world is being created anew and we're seeing it as multiplicity 
because we're living in the senses, which is breaking the unity of God into five pieces, feeding it to the mind, which is then categorizing it and trying to build relationships between it. And we're caught in that mess. And until we put that whole mess aside, we won't understand our own oneness. We'll be arguing with ourselves because we think we're a body. We think we're a mind. And the body wants us to do something we know we shouldn't do. And because we've identified with it, we've empowered it. We've split our will. We've given part of it to the body and part of it to ourself and part of it to the mind. And so we are only working with a third of our power, a third of our strength. And so we go to battle. The problem with battling with your passions is that you only do that because you want to lose. <laughs> You'll go into that battle just long enough to feel good about having battled it off, and it's reasonable that after three days I finally gave in, you know, or whatever it is. But if you're going to battle, it's because you want to lose. There's only one you inside. Know what you want and stay present, and you'll have no trouble. Understand that the mind brings only phantoms to dance in front of you. And those phantoms remind you of past experiences or may be caused by past experiences. And they make the moment look empty because it doesn't have that particular experience. And then it sets you on that quest. So this notion of being two people inside is fundamental to our problem because by calling ourselves separate from the whole, by calling ourselves separate from God, by placing God as unknown somewhere far away instead of the fully known, intimate within, causes us to be two people inside. One of them is thinking, one of them is the witness. And it's our constant confusion as to which one we are. And we get caught up. I see, I see life as a real gift, though, because it's not, not for necessarily the duality, but that we can come to the Lord's feet, that we can share that kind of, I don't know if share is the word, but just experience that kind of love, that oneness with that divine. But everything I think of, when we celebrate mother, we celebrate hunger and thirst and all the things that it's considered she gives us to have this experience of life. In that sense, I, I don't want to be uh, totally identified with the body and mind and apart from that inner love, but at the same time to be able to experience that journey, that divine journey yeah, you, no, you're absolutely right. And, and uh, you know, Sri Ramakrishna says, he says, you know, not everybody wants to be sugar. Some people just want to taste it. You know, uh, ultimately, you gave yourself life. It is your own gift to you. You know, ultimately, you are that one without a second, not, not the personality you, but that you behind all of that has given you yourself this gift of life without a will, without a goal. It's just the isness. It's up to you to experience it as you experience it. It's up to you to collect the things that give it meaning for you. But the fundamental of it is manifestation. Life isn't necessarily to do anything. It's just to be fully what you are. You know, the very, the, the very essence of love, the very essence of intelligence, and the experience of existence. It's up to you. This is your game and your play, and when you grow tired of it, you'll stop. You'll go home, only to maybe do it again. Who knows? <laughs> I had a dream once about, I was more of a watcher in it. I really wasn't one of the gods and goddesses that were sitting around the edge of this hot tub. And in that, in that dream, the, the bubbling waters of the hot tub were this material world. And we were all sitting there, and we were kind of at what, some ethereal party of gods and goddesses and laughing and playing in the water. And every now and then, somebody would slip off the edge and say, I'm going under, and whoop, you know, go under into the, this whirlpool, and then pop up laughing you know, and get back on the edge again. And so it's like that. You know, there's no divine will. 
because will is caused by imbalance. It's caused by lack. So there's just isness. God doesn't plan. He doesn't make a plan. He's not trying to do something. If he wants something, it is. It's so instantaneous. There's no planning. There's no lack. There's no want. It's just this is the will of God manifested. This is God. Just like your body right now is putting off that heat, 98.6 degrees. You're not sitting there thinking, oh, wait, wait, it's getting too hot. Cool it down. Cool. Okay. No. Oh, up, up, up. No. You don't have to do it. It's your nature. It's happening. But it's producing heat. And so when you understand your nature is divine love, that your nature is divine intelligence, and that it's wrapped in this mystery of being, your love and service like Jesus, you know, Jesus is someone who lost all of his, his delusion and just put off the body heat of being, put off the body heat of God, which means he was always a manifestation of love no matter what the condition was. He was always a manifestation of intelligence, regardless of the confusion around him. He was always wise. Not because of a great acquisition of all of these things, but because of a great letting go of everything else, so that that which is natural to him could express uninhibited. You know, We have a fight with somebody, and then we sit there and we have to argue about whether we're going to go and reconcile or not. You know, We desperately want to, but after all, they offended me. They should come and say sorry to me. I don't have to go fix this. This is their problem. They did it. And so we suffer because we can't let go of the ego. We can't let go of that fruit. You know, we're like, no, you got to apologize to me. Whereas in our nature, our nature is crying out to us, just forgive. Come on, it's your best friend. Just let it go. Let, no, they've wronged me. You know, and that battle goes on. That's that duality. That's, that's creating a separate self. We have to be courageous enough to let go of what's owed to us. And we have to be courageous enough to pay what we owe to others in that sense. But at the end of the day, know yourself. Be aware of the mind and the body and your separation from it. And be manifest. You want love. You want beauty. You want things to make sense and to be intelligent. So let it be. Let, you, let yourself manifest in that way. Don't cognate. Don't get caught in the mind. Don't look for reasons. Causes and effects are imaginary. The story of your life is imaginary. You're ever free and ever pure. This movement can be anything to you. It's not predefined. It's not packaged. So break out. Put aside those things that are restricting you. Lay down those things that are limiting you. Be love. <laughs> I don't remember the question.